From deep in the wilds of Pittsfield Township, Michigan, it's the Grace and Paul Potscast. She's a left-wing conservative Catholic homeschooler who loves to garden. He's a bearded computer geek who reads and writes like he's running out of time. Together they're raising an ever-growing army of adorkable children and planning the revolution. Hello! <laughs> That's Grace's uh, That's my, you know. contribution to the sound effects generation. Um, yeah, do what I can. So we've got a guest. Yay! Chris is back with us. Chris Travers hailing, well, calling in from Germany. Right, Happy Chris? Father's Day. Is it Father's Day there? Do they even... <laughs> Celebrate Father's Day in Germany. So. Was that I banned? I think they celebrated it at a different time. But uh. I was like wondering if that was banned because it sounded too much like Fatherland or something. Or something. No, no. Yeah, no. They just have it on a different date. Okay. Yeah. It's Father's Day here. We had a wonderful, cool, sunny day. Never, you know, yesterday. Yesterday. We fortunately were out at a park for a good chunk of the afternoon. It was just... One of those perfect well, summer days. 75 and sunny. Yeah. And really pleasant. And today, <laughs> today it's like heat warnings and everyone stay inside or, yeah. or you'll die. It's like 100 right? degrees. It feels like, well, a, it feels like 100 degrees yeah. out there. It's awful. You wouldn't do a heat warning stay inside here because nobody has air conditioning. Oh, oh yeah. 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 <laughs> heat warning, get outside. Heat warning, get outside. Exactly. Get some fresh air. Yeah. Fortunately, we <laughs> did get ours working. Function. It's not running that much. And Grace and I are in the basement, which is a godsend. Yeah. <laughs> so. I couldn't imagine doing this in an attic, your attic office up in Saginaw. Oh, God. We'd just we have just, to cancel. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I just, uh, I could barely work in there some days. Just, mm -hmm. all righty. So, um, so, yes, where are we? We are continuing, actually, uh, a conversation about Melinda Cooper's book, Family Values Between Neoliberalism and the New Social Conservatism. Right. And uh, we just, I think, kind of dipped our toes on, in the water. Yeah. We started reading uh, an interview that was printed in Viewpoint magazine, mm -hmm. which was um, Melinda Cooper and Ben Maybe. Um, and I, I thought it was a good interview, if even if a bit um, academically dense. dense. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Chris has read that and he's um, got some thoughts mm -hmm. and. Um, I haven't read that, but instead I ordered a copy of the book, which arrived, and Grace and I have been trying to read the book. And We're about two chapters in. I've missed various <laughs> parts because I actually fall asleep. It's uh, So I, I I have some notes about the book. <laughs> in fairness to me, it's bedtime when I fall asleep. Yeah, we, I'm not just we, like, that's you know. when we usually have a chance to read it out loud. Right. I try to read it out loud to her. Um yeah. And it is slow going. So it, it is a very dense book. It's written in very heavy academic jargon. And um, mm -hmm. it does mm -hmm. lighten up further on as you Wait, get into it. So if you can it. get through the beginning, the, you get to some more narrative prose. It's, yeah. It's a little better. Chapter one in particular is like her overview. And it's just packed with jargon. Right. And in chapter two, you know, it's also pretty jargony, but it starts to form... <laughs> A real narrative, a historic narrative, and it really seems like her style lightens up as she gets moving and into the topic. Right. And so I'm almost ready. Again, I've only read two chapters, but I'm almost ready to recommend to people that they buy the book and read the chapters in reverse order. Yes. Start with these chapters and get harder. Yeah. So like, start with near the present and her mm -hmm. conclusions, because maybe then you'll understand what she's getting at. Right. Right. <laughs> and then go back through all these historical stuff. She drops a lot of terminology. Um, Grace and I do not have degrees, advanced degrees in political science or economics. Mm -hmm. um, she drops a lot of terminology like um, family wage, Fordism, monetarism, public choice theory, and of course, uh, neoliberal and neoconservative. Um, right. so and some e of those even, words have clear definitions yeah. that you can just go look up. But yeah. neoliberalism and neoconservatism right. are kind of... They're a little amorphous. And even terms she she includes from other people, like Hegelian. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to see what she means by that. What do you mean by that? Right. Because, you know, that's a whole philosopher's school of thought. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so. and it's not like Hegel is uh, not uh, accused of being kind of uh, deliberately difficult uh, ob to understand. Obscure, yeah. Right, yeah. right. I mean, yeah. like, he's not one thing. Yeah. 
And even her vocabulary, like she drops in words like anathema, aegis, rubric, constitutive, you know. And my favorite that I just wrote down, which I, I still haven't looked up, is Christmas statistics. Christmas statistics? I, d- I just thought adduced. Oh, Christmas statistics. Christmas statistics. Yeah, adduced was fun too. That's a word you don't see in American English very often at all. No. A D D U C E D, and it means something like deduced, except it's to bring forth evidence into an argument. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So we had to look up stuff like that, and she also drops a lot of French phrases. So I mean, I'm used to. And the French phrases seem a little pretentious, to be honest. It, it really does. Like, uh, uh, you hit something about a, a longu dure historical analysis, and like, okay, you can figure out what that means. Like taking the long view. But then okay. she also, she dropped in the phrase toot court. Mm-hmm. And I have to look, okay, what, what does he actually mean by that? Yeah. And I think in this context, she means only or simply or mm-hmm. this with, without anything else added. Completely, right. But it's, you know, it's just, it seems needlessly hard. And um, yeah, oddball constructs like there's a, here's a sentence. They are unable to explain how the problematic of family dysfunction became so central to popular understandings of inflation. Mm-hmm. And so there she's using problematic, which is an adjective. Uh, as a noun. As a noun. I'm like, oh, come on. Yeah. yeah you can't say problem. <laughs> it's a word, you know. It's, it's really like, why, why waste an opportunity to drop in a perfectly pretentious word when a simple one would, would do. do. Yeah, why would you do that? Yeah, I, I think she could have used a, an editor and, and again, but, but, but I'm learning stuff. And I, I'm, oh, yeah. And no, so, it's... like, she uh, talks about, in Chapter 2, she mentions the Mother's Pensions Program. Yeah. Which, we're back in history enough that I have to confess I didn't really know much about that at all. No, but, it, it was good stuff. And then um, this whole chapter is largely about the attacks um, from both neoconservatives and neoliberals on AFDC. Yeah. Aid to Families with Dependent Children. Which is which was originally ADC, Aid to Dependent Children. Right. And, you know, came to be Aid to Families with Dependent Children, and it finally died its final death in the 90s. Yeah, and I, I have passages on that I want to, uh, to, to just read. Sure. Um, some passages marked, but, um, yeah, it really was mostly dismantled during the Clinton years, but Mm -hmm. it became, the thing became a political football quite some time ago. Oh, like in the 60s, like emerging in the early 60s, it became like, I don't know, really? We're going to include blacks? Are you sure that's a good idea? This program was outsized in its its level of political controversy, right? Right. It it represented about 1% of GDP. Right. It was really, like it's, It's the small potatoes, it's pocket change, but we spent an inordinate amount of time debating it yeah. on the con- congressional floor for decades. Yeah. Right. We Where, did decades whereas, and decades. Yeah, whereas programs like... Um, Star Wars. Well, no, but yeah, them, but, but yeah. also like Medicaid, you know, and uh, Great Society and New mm-hmm. Deal programs don't get that kind of debate because they're established and popular. Well, and they're and they're also not well, means tested. They're not means tested. Yeah. So, and and it's interesting that when they finally killed it, the the programs they replaced it with uh, exclude all immigrants for ten years. Yes. Which so is, even if you're here um, legally, you have a green card, you're yes. a citizen. Right. As a citizen, you can't access it until you've been exactly. here ten years. Right. Which yeah. is um. You know, Clinton was, was so much better on immigration oh. than Trump is. <laughs> you know. uh, Trump is doing his best to be worse. It's not clear he will succeed. He, but he's trying. <laughs> he's trying. Yeah, he is. And, and I mean, regarding that, you know, I, I've been trying to get to the root of the reporting about these, you know, child oh. separations and all that. Uh, yeah, and it's really it's really frustrating. It's really it's frustrating because the liberal mouth breathing and and hand waving, pearl clutching, pearl clutching, is mostly by people who never bothered to look at what this these policies were, were these policies were doing under Obama. Right. I mean, no, I mm-hmm. I've been 
upset about this for 15 years. Mm-hmm. I've been called all kinds of names because for eight years, I couldn't find any media coverage. Mm-hmm. I'll leave it to you to figure mm-hmm. out which eight years where I couldn't yeah, find right. any media coverage. <laughs> oh, I know. Right. <laughs> I and, remember being, and so, being married to a non-American. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's painfully yeah. obvious. And so yeah. suddenly now this thing, and actually during those eight years when I would criticize um, Obama's immigration policy, yeah. I mean, I was really derided. People really yeah. were angry that I would, you know, turn on him in this way. Oh, and right. I and how, I would say oh, yeah. things how like, "How could you, you turn know, against a fellow a fellow black man?" Don't don't start. <laughs> don't go there. Um, <laughs> and I point out, you know, we have concentration camps on the border. Yeah, we have for a long time. Mm-hmm. We're keeping families there. We're keeping children there. I mean, mm-hmm. this is appalling. Yeah. And people are mm-hmm. like, like, they've got every idea in their head. And it's, and this is what's funny to me. They would say to me what 45 supporters are saying to them now. Exactly. Well, those people committed crimes. That's what happens. Right. Exactly. And I heard that all the well, time from, from I, the so-called left. Yeah. Right. I also heard a lot of people saying, how dare you, how dare you criticize Obama on any of this stuff? You're just helping the Republicans. They'll get into office oh, and they'll sure. be worse. Sure. They'll be worse. And, and the thing is that. What this means is people engage in this sort of um, uh, this idea that we're going to vote for the lesser evil by hoping that we vote for the loser on a race to the bottom. But then instead of just trying to still try to lose the race to the bottom, then the whole point is to try to help them win that race. Win the race. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Somehow. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, no. Yeah. We have to help him. Everything we exactly. can to move him forward on his brutal, yeah. vicious immigration policy. <laughs> Yeah, we have to cheer, and so like yeah. these people who were cheering three years ago are now asking me where the pro life movement is, huh? <laughs> <laughs> like, dude, I've been there, man. I got tired of waiting and went on a bathroom break, and yeah. suddenly you guys are here freaking out. Yeah, and and you know there mm-hmm. are I think there are some some qualitative things Trump is doing differently. So, so things are d- d- changed to a degree. Change to a degree. Uh, the the his specific enforcement thing. priorities are changed. Right. To, yeah, and, that's a specific thing. Is that everything? Every border crossing is being prosecuted right. as a misdemeanor. Right. And then, but a lot, an awful lot of it is just because he uses his outside voice inside. You know. Yes. Yep. Yeah. And, it, it was embarrassing. Yeah. Um, and and I, I honestly have a strong suspicion that a lot of what Trump does is tries to be a more um, obviously evil version of the people who came before, because mm. then when everybody criticizes him, then he's able to say, but you guys were doing all the same things there. It's largely the, uh, the uh, antics of an internet troll. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm like he's basically literally a professional on, on troll. Twitter. Yeah, literally. That's literally what he's just doing on Twitter. Troll. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's astounding that this is where we've come to. <laughs> where we've come to. Yeah. Although it's hard to imagine leading any other place in this destination. Right. I mean, it's it's the president we deserve you right. know, we've collectively, earned him. I guess. We've earned him. We got that big mirror that we can stare at and see what the country looks <laughs> See what our country looks like. Yeah. So so yeah, it, it's it's a bit of an atrocity that we've come to, or it's a complete atrocity that we've so normalized. I'm just having this moment of stunned silence. We're watching all the, the media frenzy right now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, huh? But I thought this was like, so it's the numbers now. So the volumes increased dramatically and now it's bad. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I guess I can see that reasoning, but okay. Yeah, and and uh, we've got pictures, and sometimes oh, yeah. the pictures Here's, they're showing, it turns out, actually, oh, those were taken during the Obama, Obama administration. administration. Oops, <laughs> sorry. And we didn't run them then. We've had right. these pictures, right? But here's and what one of these facilities looks like, and then everyone faints. It's like, oh, uh, uh, that was that. We've been doing that, yeah, for a while. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, it's where where, where did we start here? Uh, just just sort of like the convergence of the po- of policy. Mm-hmm. Where policy converges in the same place. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. what's the, there's a great meme, you know, it doesn't matter who's in office, the bombs never stop. Yeah, yeah. They just keep coming. Yeah. All right. So we could try and pick up with the um, interview. 
mm-hmm. or I could read some of the passages that I marked from let's, the book. Let's go through the interview first. Okay. okay. You got you've got some markup. I've on got the... some markup, and I'm sure Chris has got some ideas. Yeah. And please. then we can go. We can segue into the book, which I think it gets a little deeper. It gets a little, it gets deeper. A little denser. Um. So my my lead concern with all of this, I think she surfaces some great ideas, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But um, and I help me out if you if I'm just missing this, Chris. I don't know what her point is. Like, <laughs> these are some great ideas, but but what's your point? Like, what? So this is great. Okay. So is your point? Is her point just that there's a deep convergence on family values between neoliberals and neoconservatives, and that the difference is only in what they imagine the family should look like? But that's it. Or is there some, is there some deeper thing that I'm just missing? Because it feels like she's alluding to something deeper, like when she talks about yeah. wanting to make a, wanting to make a critique of the family, and I'm like, okay, what's your critique of the family? And it, we we never get it. In the interview, you never in, get in, it. In the interview, we never get. It. Yeah, we don't really know yet what all is in the book. But, and so uh, we'll get we'll get there. So so we'll get there. Um, but that's my big question. So um, this idea, this big idea, if that's it, mm-hmm. that there's this convergence, yeah, she maps out, uh, what was the first thing I highlighted here? Just how, um, yes. So she talks about something called the poor, poor laws. Yeah. And how... Um, Again, not, not clearly cited or defined, and I, I right. can kind of jump at it. But. And there's, so poor laws go back to um, English common law for centuries Mm -hmm. and um, specifically throughout uh, the Americas and in Australia and in like European um, English colonies, English speaking colonies, poor laws came back to the fore in the 18th century, but pardon me, the 19th century, 1800s, basically to restore order for people who were indigent in the wave of factory openings and, you know, the collapse of various farms and things like that. So you're wandering around indigent, and that's that's the Dickens the the Dickensian story story right, right and your family won't have any, any part of you anymore it's their responsibility to take take care of you and so if they don't then the state puts you in a workhouse yeah and here's here's a Dickens documented well here's what that actually looks like yeah that's what it actually looks like not very pretty yeah um so now mind you on, on its surface it would make some level of sense to say that families bear a legal responsibility to their family members. In practice, it was a mechanism for um, basically slave slavery, slave labor, slave it's, labor, yeah. right? So, well, it wasn't practice. At least, at least you know, temporary slave temporary labor, temporary slave labor, which often became life <laughs> lifetime Lifelong. service. Right. Uh, so the policy reach. I'm, I'm quoting from the um, interview. The policy reach of their project to reinstate the family was vast and extended to everything from welfare to education to fiscal policy. Their specific interest in reviving the poor laws took shape very early on and was first acted on by Ronald Reagan during his time as governor of California. So, um, and here he tried to revive the existing but dormant or deactivate state poor laws relating to everything from the care of aged parents to children in state institutions and single mothers on welfare. And the idea being, it's kind of like if you see this right now, when, when uh, women apply for like WIC or for food stamps or something, the state of Michigan, I'm not going to speak for other states, it's like, so where's this kid's dad? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because, you yeah, know, yeah. if he's not stepping up, we need to find him and make him step up. Yeah, make him pay. And so this is use the weight of, of sanctions, sanctions, law, the state and, and law, you know, and really even, even wage wage garnishment, wage garnishment, that. or in some places even jail time. The jail time. Yeah, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying here that I'm opposed to making dads support their families, but um, you got to no. look at what the you know, what this actually what, means what that practice. actually means in practice, what it does, you what know. it does to the community, what it does to the individuals involved, and so yeah. on. When the fact is the state has this money, they're going to spend this money, and I'm, I'm, I'm personally opposed to any means testing on food stamps. I mm-hmm. think if you want food stamps, you should be able to walk in and they hand them to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, that's just me. Like, if you're going to do it, why are you asking how much money they have? When, when, we get, when I get to the passages in the book, I want to read one of them talks about how 
Milton Friedman uh, at one stage in his arc <laughs> was a uh, an advocate of, of UBI, uh, right. you know, reverse taxation as a form mm-hmm. of universal basic, basic income. income. And basically to replace social programs with something that's not tested in, in any right. way. It just kicks in right. when you don't have income. You don't have income. Here you go. You know. Here's income. Right. And that's, there's all kinds of good arguments about that. But that was a conservative consensus yes. for a time. For a long for a while. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because of the support it provides to the community and to the economy. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. That we don't have these folks who, look, aren't contributing anything to the economy. Here's some money they can get back into the economy. Um, so that policy reach, that was um, longstanding. Reagan was governor back in the 70s and mm-hmm. 60s in California. Yeah. Um, so that's been around mm-hmm. a long time to engender this policy of moving and shifting responsibility from the state to the family, which, again, I want to be clear, I'm not actually opposed to personally in every way, that I'd prefer families to take care of themselves over the state taking care of them. Mm-hmm. But if we're going to have state welfare, then I right. think there's some ways it should, be, it should function. Yeah. And, and this isn't quite it. Well, and, <clears throat> and, and I think one of, one, of, one of the key things that I've noticed from living in Europe is that there are a lot of programs in Europe that are not means t- tested. So things mm-hmm. like, um, you know, child subsidies and that sort of thing. You know, in the U.S. Mm-hmm. you have the earned income credit, but it is means tested. Yes. Right? Um, in, in Europe, the closest things you have are, are things like Kindergeld in Germany and, and Barnbidrag in Sweden. And those are, uh, those are not means tested. You have kids, you get money. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And... You know, what, one of the basic points here is that there's some degree of encapsulation of the family that the, that sort of pro- program um, has because it's not means tested. And when you means test things, now you start reaching into the specifics of finance of a, of a particular family. Right. And that's a, that's a lot more disruptive than I think a lot of people want to admit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's this sort of like broad social level where now you've got people who just miss the mark for means testing, right? Mm-hmm. Those people are desperate. They're yeah. absolutely desperate yeah. too. And now they're they're um playing off you play the poor off each other. Right. So you, yeah. now they're they're actually instead of looking at their employers and the system as their oppressors, they're angry about these poor people getting a handout when they can't get a handout. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and which is a really sick dynamic to set up in society. No, it's a crab it's sort mm-hmm. of a Crab bucket An situation crab bucket, by right? design. Yeah. And then, um, but there's also this sort of like personal invasion that you have to engage. Can you, mm-hmm. um, right. you re- remember the last time we were on uh, food assistance? Yeah. And we were running out of savings. Oh, you yeah. You know, I had applied for an awful lot of jobs. There wasn't a lot to be found. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were looking into, okay, what is actually available as far as helping us uh, cash assistance that would help us pay our mortgage you know oh, right right and yeah you know, tell say a little bit about what the what they offered so what exists now is something called TANF temporary aid to needy families mm-hmm. and it's like capped there's like a lifetime cap you can get it for so many years ever in your lifetime yeah and it, i should say it's it's very it's shockingly small like really shocking like 2 dollars so, like, so in other words we were supposed to show up. Paul was supposed to show up at like um, like a job training class. Yeah. Meanwhile, I'm also supposed to be full time searching for a job and documenting that in order to get food benefits. In order to get your unemployment benefits. Right. And then. Uh, yeah, that's right. Unemployment. And so you're supposed to spend 40 hours a week in your job training class, which there's a certain comedy about that. Right, they're like going to teach they me how to use how to use Excel, how to so use I can Excel get a job, and how to you know write a resume, <laughs> etc. And and I'm I'm supposed to you know you're supposed to be there too. I'm supposed to be there too, because I don't know dropping out of grad school wasn't enough. Uh, <laughs> I should do some more. And forty hours for me. Mm-hmm. And then there would be like some ambiguous sort of state paid sponsored childcare. They we put could our labor. kids in a government school classroom or classroom something. Some kind. <laughs> like my nursing child had to go, etc. Right. Um, for eight hours a day, five days a week. And I think what we would get was the equivalent of $2 an hour. 
Yeah, if you looked at it in terms of of actually like right. what what money would we get versus the number of hours uh, we so spent. So like we'd lose the entire work day. Yep. And for the week and get in exchange roughly $2 an hour. What was it? So it was like 80 hours, <coughs> like $160 a week. Yeah, and it wasn't enough to pay even our very modest very modest mortgage, mortgage there. Or the water bill. Well, it could or, pay, it could pay the water. It would bill. pay the water bill. It yeah. would pay the water bill, but right. it would not pay the utilities or any anything. Yeah. So here that we you are. Need cash for traumatizing our our infant children, you know, and our older children too. Right. Sitting in a classroom learning skills that aren't honestly weren't going to help well, completely get a job useless. in the region. Right. Completely useless to both of us for the region. Right. Yeah. And um, for the sake of being able to earn, you know. This two dollars far less than minimum wage, even at at the time and place. Say, right. So, so was this the sort of absurdity uh, about? I mean, really, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Chris. They're probably not even going to teach you how to write a resume because these programs are going to be aimed at minimum wage workers. Sure. And uh, <laughs> they don't have resumes per se. <laughs> not like mine, at least. Yeah, exactly. Right. But, but no, they, they might they, teach you how to show, fill out a job application form or something. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was really just like. You can't be serious, right? Yeah. <laughs> and they were, they were completely serious. They were totally serious. And here's the thing. It's directed at minimum wage workers. No one who's, you know, no, no one with our um, economic and educational background was expected to be in the room. Yeah. yeah. Full stop. It's being, it's, you know, it's class segregated, right? Sure. So there's no way... Um, they they right. would have accepted us I th- had we oh, they, had we had chosen we to do it to everything to all the hoops and right. filled out all the forms they would have accepted they us they would have accepted us I, I almost wanted to do it just so I could document what what it was like what it was like yeah. and I think the only thing that stopped us was that we didn't the want trauma our, to the kids we didn't want that yeah. kind of trauma for our children um, to separate them from mm-hmm. us during yeah. the day and and so on yeah and um and they you know there were some of them that are, were school age but largely they, they you know they hadn't gone to school they've only been ever been homeschooled um and how shall i say um i don't know who these people are <laughs> they, no we're gonna leave no. our kids <laughs> could have been anybody anywhere yeah you so, know yeah. they're probably someone else earning minimum wage minimum or wage, less right minimum. some kind of you know yeah. other they're state. in a job training program and learning how to do child, child care. care for all i know <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> For all we understand about the situation. <laughs> so it, it was this deeply absurd. And if you think about it, so from our perspective, we look at this and we're like, are you kidding? You can't possibly be serious yeah. that you expect this. For. For. 80 bucks a week or whatever. 80 bucks, yeah, whatever, whatever it was. Whatever it was, $160 a week. Yeah. Um, and then, um, but there are people for whom that's the deal they get and that's the deal they take. Yeah. And mind you, it's specifically understood that this is a deterrent to having people use TANF funds. Yeah, exactly. So it's built and structured to deter you for, and repel for, you from, from all using. But, all but the, literally the most desperate. Yeah, so unless you're absolutely positively desperate, you're not going to use these TANF funds. You're not going to try to access them in any way. You don't want anything to do with it. Uh, and um, that's actually not new or unusual. This is what we do. We make the make accessing benefits so hard and so miserable and so degrading and so harmful to our families mm-hmm. that people are just like, you know, never mind, I'll figure it out. Yeah. Well, I'll mean, lose the house. And when, I, you know. and, and when I needed something like this, I was actually turned away pretty much flat out because of the fact that I just returned to the country with my wife and with my um, firstborn child mm-hmm. and you know, um, basically, when you when you fill out the affidavit of support, mm-hmm. it says basically that uh, you know under this uh, under the uh, poor uh, law signed into law by Bill Clinton, if uh, if if the person you are providing the affidavit to support has any federal assistance for the first ten years of being in the United States, you owe that money back to the federal government. Yeah. And wow. then basically you show up, you say, look, I showed up in, you know, the middle of the dot-com crash. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. people really need, people in, in trouble really need a loan. Yeah. You know? That's going to help out. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, it says, well, you know, um, if your wife's not a citizen, we can't help you. And 
Like, oh. uh, it's it's a it's a really interesting experience here, and you know, I still have friends that can't understand why I have such a, a really hostile reaction to um, the Clinton era welfare reform over that experience. Yeah, right. Yeah. That you know, you know, <laughs> right. the, you know you, the one day you show up and you need it, yeah. and it's just gone. Yeah. It's just not you know, no, right. not yeah. you. Sorry. Now I I do want to say not you. Th- these mm-hmm. um these programs very wildly and so like for example i actually have almost nothing bad at all to say about the snap program the food benefits program oh yeah it's pretty good it was i found it given that we were you know already used to cooking and eating pretty frugally and low on the food chain Mm -hmm. you know right i i found it to be plenty generous honestly very generous it actually Um, yeah it actually paid for just about everything we wanted to eat mm-hmm. you know and so that really kept us it let us stock up our basement with canned beans and rice and uh, basically mm-hmm. everything we needed to keep everyone pretty healthy pretty healthy and well fed well, so and, and yeah we we were on wick for a year, uh, for a year and uh, wick, it was it was a real benefit mm-hmm. wick is a little um, odd a little frustrating it it does help it helped us but they're very restrictive about the specific foods you can buy. And for example, the thing oh, yes. that, that, that we ran into and that um, our friends are, are running into constantly is that they subsidize, say, an enormous amount of, of cow's, cow's milk. milk. Oh, Low-fat cow's mm-hmm. milk. Right. All you, basically all you could possibly drink. And a large oh, yes. portion of the population genetically can't really digest that or no. be healthy on that diet. It's like... Oh. You know, I was telling Grace about this, uh, how like chugging a gallon of milk has become a white supremacist symbol. Uh, (laughs) You're really saying, look, I'm white and I can digest milk. It's white, too. You know, and and, and the other side to it, though, is that, you know, I mean, because of the way the um, because of the way the um, uh, the program was implemented, at least in Washington. You go through, you do all your shopping, yeah. you get to the shopping, ca- uh, you get to the checkout oh, line, yeah, yeah. and then they say, but wait, you got the wrong brand of eggs. Yeah, yeah. yeah we went, we went through that too. We, we've had and, the booklet, we went through the training, and we're like checking out. And, uh, you know, we're, the, we're those assholes who are blocking traffic for 20 minutes. while yes, we exactly. go through every item in our cart trying to figure out, okay, well, why isn't this? I mean, it says in the pamphlet we can buy this on this card. But we can't card. buy this. It won't scan. Yeah, it won't scan. Right. And it was only... No, they would it was scan only, it, and then they would, then they would just tell us, look, you have to get these other ones because they're less expensive, and, and therefore we get a better yeah. margin for it as the, uh, yeah, as the grocery right. store. Oh, and hey. I see. Well, at least they were honest yeah. about that. Right. Yeah. But it is, it is, it is, um, it helps people, I want to say. Yeah, yeah, But it, it is this, this specific program of subsidies for specific partner companies and providers. Yeah. Right. 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 And that's maybe... That feels a little, it's a little dirty, a little fraught with you know conflicts of interest. interest right. Well, no, because if I was, if they, they actually, I was going to drink milk, yeah, they actually held Grace's Wick training at Walmart. Right. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> they could Walmart. walk her around and say, "Here's well, all the things you can buy at Walmart right. with Wick." Here you go, and could like literally hold my hand and show me around the Walmart and welcome me to come. Spend these government benefits yeah. at Walmart. <laughs> and, uh, and the stuff was branded. The the handouts right. were all branded. All Walmart branded and yeah. everything. And, um, but yeah, so that was fewer things that we would normally eat. We did we did yeah. use some food from work. But we, yeah, some of the food but was a lot basic of it, food and we used it. Yeah, a lot of it we just couldn't use though. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, that happens. Um, whereas I, I feel like SNAP, is, especially Michigan, again, you can't speak for every state in the United right. States. Right, right. Um, was generous in benefits, covered anything we wanted to eat, largely. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, okay, didn't cover beer. Um, and oh, I'm yeah, sorry, but if you're an employee, you need decent beer. beer <laughs> you need decent beer. Um, and then... Um, uh, we should push for a separate program. A separate program. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and it covered seeds and it covered plants that grow food. And mm-hmm. it was you. We, you could use it at most farmers' markets. Actually, I think at this point, 
in 2018, you can use it at every farmer's market in the state of Michigan. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I think that's yeah. a fantastic um, plan because you're really choosing to, it's right. a form of distributism, right? right. You're spending your, your support locally. Right. And that's, so yeah. I really can't speak ill of that program. It's great. It's food. Everyone needs it. Yeah. We all yeah. should have it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Unemployment was another matter in Michigan. And that, and then trying to collect an unemployment from having been employed in a different state for a year, was a freaking nightmare. Oh my God, that, <laughs> I'm giggling all, that now. just about uh, my heart just about ruptured with stress. Uh, being on from the phone experience. every day trying to get them to to pay out the, the unemployment, right? For this, you know, honestly, what was a feeble amount of money, but enough but, to it was yeah, enough to it's pay better out than mortgage. Michigan's unemployment though. Right. It was actually better than Michigan's right, unemployment. Right, right. Michigan's unemployment has been maxed out the the max benefit i believe is still 362 dollars a week yep for and it has been for since the late 90s 14 15 since the late 90s. 20 years yeah, yeah it's like it's been that for 20 years yeah and like prices haven't gone up right but right that's still and what that's you get. the best you, can, the do. Best you can do and you constantly every week you have to file the forms attesting to the jobs you've applied for Mm -hmm. And the the way the forms are set up is they still expect like what's the name and phone number of the hiring manager and address at the company you applied at, and oh no gosh. companies no companies hire that way anymore. That's not how it they works. just direct you to their website, you yeah. know, and so everything's yeah. online, and. And so you're doing this like forensics project trying to find this right, company right, to document fill out the form. who it was and right. and who I spoke to and. You know, I mean, you can't do it without just largely just making shit up, you know. All right. Uh, there's just no way. Inviting fraud. Right. Uh, so but the, the next the next piece here, she, she goes on and she's talking about this shift from, um, because I think her thesis is the, the neoliberals and conservatives are the same. And what they want to do is move care for the family, care for individuals away from the state and into families. Mm-hmm. And so what this means is instead of SNAP, instead of WIC, instead of unemployment benefits, instead of all these sort of what we've come to think of as pretty well basics of a welfare state, just real, real basic stuff, yeah. that all those things should take place inside of a family. Uh, education, all that should take, take place inside of a family. And I think we can have a conversation, and I'd like to at some other point, um, that I, I'm not personally... I don't think that's the worst thing I've ever heard. However, what this means in practice in the world we actually live in is that family responsibility takes the form of intergenerational debt, mm -hmm. where parents, well, family members are actively enrolled is, in their debt obligations. This is how it works now. This in is how our it works now. now. This is the economy we have. This is what this is how what that looks like. Yeah. So if there is no, you run out of unemployment benefits, that becomes right. money your family provides to you. Right, which is their oh. retirement. Which is their retirement. Or, their, or your inheritance. <laughs> or, or whatever it was. Yeah. Right. Or maybe you're just lucky enough to have relatives that have money. Yeah. Well, and, right. and you know, one of the, one of the really important um, aspects of this is, you know, you go back, um, you know, obviously this is a Marxist analysis, so we can probably get into the, these parts later. But um, one of the things that Marx uh, was fairly strong about pointing out was that as long as investors need money, uh, want more money to reinvest, they need to be able to get en enough um, returns on their investments to increase mm -hmm. their investable capital. And the only way you can do that is if you're draining money from somebody else. Right. And uh, yeah. one of Rosa Luxemburg's com um, contributions here is that the only way this works in practice is First of all, when you're draining money initially from your domestic uh, market, uh, draining money from the families into, into the hands of, of the corporations and mm -hmm. eventually the investors. And later on, when you do that abroad through colonialism and imperialism and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one, one of the funny things here is that as long as neoconservatives and neoliberals are saying we need to move the responsibility into the family, Mm -hmm. But the family is a working class family. This is really important. Mm -hmm. The companies can't generate as much demand on payouts as they generate in sales. So where does right, that money right. come from? It comes from that debt exactly as you're speaking. Mm -hmm. It comes from the debt. Yeah. 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 Right. 
um, uh, uh, Cooper talks about that in a way. What precipitated this crisis and this attack on AFDC mm-hmm. was um, what it was called the Volcker shock, which is this crisis of inflation and stagflation that right. started in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't, uh, at the time, um, working class people were were largely unionized were right. were doing well enough and getting wage increases frequent with, with en- en- enough such that they were actually still continuing to grow their income despite right. this inflation happening not a big deal but it was the investor mm-hmm. class people who collect passive income who became hysterical and started to say this has to this you has know, to stop now this has to stop this None is this. a and so mm-hmm. she she writes at some length, and the argument gets a little opaque for me, not knowing all that much about Keynesianism and monetarism and all that. I know something right. about it, but it becomes basically how inflation produced this so-called moral crisis. This moral panic. This right? moral panic. Yeah. About you know, AFGC. Yeah. Be- well, and the it's it's actually somewhat straightforward, I think. You think? Okay. In that. If you're a working class person and you bought your house, you're, and you've got a 30 year mortgage, yeah. that doesn't go up. Yeah. Your yeah. largest expense does not go up. Your 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 uh, mortgage doesn't go up in right. d- dollar denominated dollar denominations terms. But your wages its value its value actually decreases. You can pay it off faster. Pay it off faster. Yeah. But in your wages, mm-hmm. if you're um, in a union job, are probably going up. Going up with inflation. Yeah. So you're still able to buy mm-hmm. your food and your necessities. That's not an issue, yeah. and you still have disposable income. Yeah. However, if you're an investor. If the money you invested in year one, yeah, even if it grows, it's not going to grow faster than runaway inflation. So right. actually, at right. the end of five years, you have less money. I mean, you have more money in dollars than you started with, but yeah. you don't have more buying power, sure. more investment power than you started with. And that's why that was a crisis for those for people <laughs> for those people that's a crisis that's an issue yeah. now mind you those folks aren't eating any less they no, haven't sure. lost their homes uh, they haven't even not gained they haven't really. even not gained I mean, they just don't they aren't ahead of yeah. where they were right they've kind of stuck close to zero kind of like wages have for the last 40 years yeah and so this was a, a movement to reverse to flip that, the script to flip that yeah and make it so we're the ones losing the ground. wages <laughs> lose ground, yes. whereas investment gains ground. Yep. So that's and that's that's orthodoxy right. now. That, that's what, that's, that's how, orthodoxy that's, now. That's, that's how it works now. Why you have like CEO of an airline, you know, or, or the investors in airlines say, you know, complaining and the conference calls saying, you know, once again it looks like labor wins and investors are left out in the cold. Huh. <laughs> Because they gave <laughs> some modest raise to the employees, like, like huh? <laughs> yeah. As if, as if any of these investors are literally Broke. out in the cold. Yeah, right. Not. I mean, they all have a warm bed to sleep. They all have food to eat. Yeah. We're not talking about that. Mm-hmm. So, um, that that's the and the moral panic is: look at all these folks who are getting this money. It's destroying their families. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's and, destroying their will to work. Yeah. And that, replacing that's replacing fathers. That's the moral hazard that and, is, gets talked about a lot. You know, and I'm I'm in the I'll be honest, I'm in the the state shouldn't replace families, the state shouldn't replace fathers camp. But I don't think that means um how shall I say? Wage earners, people shouldn't get a living wage, <laughs> right? Right. To you know, to induce them to work harder. Well, it's, and, yeah. and this is this isn't anything new. I mean, you know, you go way back to uh, to the enclosure period in in England, and yes. you know, people were saying the same thing about you know peasants on their land. You know, they're so lazy. They're so lazy, just you know, laying just around. Imagine what happened if they worked in the factories? Uh, they could have in- industry. They could learn thrift. They could be. They could yeah. produce things. They could know the value and dignity of their work, instead of loafing yeah. around uh, on their homesteads. Yeah, Finish, raise, finishing their farm labor by noon, and then having the rest of the, the day, day to chill out with their families. Yeah. You know how awful. Right, right. And <laughs> what a nightmare that must be for them. 
<laughs> we've got to save them from their degeneracy. That degeneracy. So, and this is this is that conversation. Mm-hmm. That's what that yeah. is. Because in the enclosure movement, that conversation was: there's nobody to work in our factories. Yeah. How are we going to make money if people don't make the stuff for us? Right. Right. This is this is kind of another issue I have with with the book, which is if you've ever tried to read any of Chomsky's books as opposed yeah. to listen to his talks or read transcripts of his better, talks right. you find that in his talks it's he's really lucid and is easy to follow mm-hmm. but in his books he constantly sort of drifts into the same sort of sarcasm that he often uses in his talks but it's not so obvious right and so if you don't know the subject really well you may find it hard to notice which sentences he's meaning sarcastically <laughs> ironically right and she does a little bit of a similar thing where she often sort of leaves the conclusion out of a, right. of a given, not the whole argument, but of a given part of the argument, argument where she's like, this, ha- this happened, then, and then, You're you like, know. therefore? What? She, does, she leaves out the therefore and kind of assumes, I think, that the audience is just nodding along and, and says, saying the therefore part to themselves. Wow. Right, and that's not. Oh, I, I don't think. Sure I think that. it's a little too much of an assumption in some cases. Right, right. Yeah, and she goes on <clears throat> talking about neoliberals. That there's, it's very obvious, I think, to most Americans how neoconservatives view the family as this locus, mm-hmm. right, of um, of, of society. Neoliberals are only different in that they have a minimalist understanding of fam of what a family is, or mm-hmm. what family responsibility mm-hmm. is. So they for, for them. Family responsibility meant the family or the couple should be the primary source of economic security. And this way functions mm-hmm. as a substitute of the welfare state. And th- it doesn't matter what the family looks like. That's why they were early advocates of same-sex marriage. Yeah. That's why, you know, right. all these things that we think of as culture war things, neoliberals are like, yeah, you know, whatever. As long as the family pays for it, that's, we're good. That's the, the that's literally, I'll, re- I'll read some bits, but that's literally her, def- like, her take on the neoliberal definition of family like, is yeah, that a unit that uh, that is productive uh, you know productive economically right, right? that's and all the cultural and moral issues they actually uh, cede to neoconservatives to lecture them about right, right? Neo- <laughs> let neoconservatives have that conversation about those moral issues right but but if you but, know any productive unit that's a family but if they're not Goodbye. productive Right. Then the neoliberals and the neoconservatives speak in one voice one to voice. denounce their degeneracy. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. You're not producing anything? Wait a minute. It's, it's fascinating and horrifying. To, At the same yeah. time, right? Right. So, um, yeah. Well, this is a one good place. What Foucault called care of the self is a central imperative of neoliberalism, but it would be better be defined as care of kin. So, you know, that's on you. Mm-hmm. So your yeah. kids need your kids need milk. Well, that's on you. If you want to, you should you should be in a better school district. Yeah, you should be. That's that's on you. You want an education? You're gonna have to. Oh, but you can't like drive there. We'll put you in prison for that. You've got to pay the taxes there. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, that you should unpack that. Oh, people, oh yeah. People who actually do their best to get their kids into a better school system, system. as per neoliberal ideology. Right. Uh, so <laughs> specifically, I'm thinking of a case in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where a homeless woman had her child in a daycare in a good school district mm-hmm. and so listed the, day, the daycare as his home address. They are homeless. Yeah. There's they no have other no other home. There's no other home. This is where he spends most of his time. shelter somewhere else. Right. Or... And, she, and like during the night, she goes to shelters, stays on friends' couches, etc. And that, since that's variable, she listed the only permanent address that she had access to. Mm-hmm. Um, which, so, you know, in the, in the context, this is not a lie. So she enrolls the child in school. Someone notices that she doesn't look like the other parents and the, the child doesn't look like the other kids. <laughs> and like, where are they from? What address is this? Maybe it has some shabby, shabby shoes or something. Something, or, or some kind of tell. Yeah. I'm not going to speculate. Know, speculate. <laughs> but there was some kind of tell. And so, what, so what triggered the shaming, naming and shaming? shaming? <laughs> right. So someone does some digging and they're like, you know, I think that's a daycare. I don't think she lives there. Yeah. Where is this person? And so the city where her child is going to school actually arrested her yeah. and prosecuted her for fraud and sent her to prison. Right. Wow. And then... <laughs> 
demanded that she pay tuition for, I think it was 18 months that her child was in school there. Yeah. So they wanted the tuition back. They put her in prison. And then the child's in Child Protective Services. services. <laughs> because... The tender mercies of the state, because that's better. Because that's better, right? Because... Than having such a moral degenerate for a mother. <laughs> right? Yeah, can't, yeah. Can't, let, can't let parents try to put their kids in good schools. So that uh, would be wrong. That would that be would the be worst wrong. thing. Yeah. Right. And so, I don't know, how do you win? And now, mind you, do you know why her child's in daycare? It's because she works full time. Yeah, right. So, you know. A strange game. It seems the only winning strategy is not, not to, to play. play. <laughs> yes. Oh, good grief. So, so that that's like the neoliberal idea of how we're supposed to manage our families. And that if you fail, there's just nothing but penalty. It's only punitive. Mm-hmm. It's only punitive. Yeah, yeah. It's only punitive if you fail at managing your family. I mean, honestly, if this was less like okay, a free for all, manage your family as best you can. I, I'm feeling like she was winning personally. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like she figured it out. Everyone was eating. The child was at school. She was working. She was doing the things, and yet, yeah. And it's kind of like this. You know, the same kind of moral degeneracy punitive response to women who like go apply for a job let the child play yeah. in the park yeah in broad daylight somehow for a, half an this, hour this was a rule and somehow it became a felony you know now it's a felony yeah. right I, for some reason um so that that disparity is like this um this and, idea and by, by the way white people uh, jiggle and manipulate these systems all Constantly. the time <laughs> right? it's a freaking norm it's a freaking norm and, and the other side to it is that, you know, I mean, these rules exist very much on a class basis, right? Perse- precisely. So, right. you know, the whole point here is that they are um, finding ways of pushing people who don't have lots of money to spend more money for things like daycare. Right. It's yeah. all about, again, increasing that debt burden. Right. Because that's where the investor class gets their money. Yeah. Yes. Right. And, you know, so it, previously we were talking about state debt and how we want to reduce the state deficit and yada, yada, yada. We're just going to shift all of that onto individuals and, the, and part of their family budget, that debt, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and say, okay, so you guys just pay that off. You take it on. And it's now a personal responsibility thing. Well, right. you took out the debt. Now you got to pay it, you know? Sorry. But unlike a government mm-hmm. funding scenario, when it becomes personal res- responsibility like that, it often actually is a zero sum game, right? Right. Uh, in the local, you know, context. Right. Well, in the context of reality and limits, yeah, it's going to be zero sum. There's only yeah. so much. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. All right. So, so you the, got some more to for, uh, just a couple to, more to say to, about the article. If there's more that you have to say about the article that you were thinking of. Uh, if you want okay, to cite, cite some things from the article, let's do that, and then I want to move. I want to move on and read some qu- book? Qu- okay. quotes from the book. Because I, I think I have one one more thing. Okay. But that's it. Oh, just the sort of the the feminist angle here, right? Um. Yes. <clears throat> of course, I th- I you know it's not hard to believe. I'm I'm not sure I'm in the same camp with her as as a feminist. Um. I rarely am in the same camp as someone else as a feminist, but it's oh, always kind I of exciting. I think you regard yourself as too but, radical for most feminists. <laughs> but, but, but the thing is, you know, I mean, I mean, a lot of things are sort of dialogues, and one learns um, much more from people with different viewpoints than from people who agree all the time. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. And so, you know, yeah. I think the Marxist feminists, in particular, have. Um, an angle that that they discuss, which um, is very often omitted in any of the discussions we have in the U.S. Mm-hmm. Um, Sp- specifically, because yeah, basically, us, yeah, uh, basically, the the Marxist uh, feminist concern is over um, gender, biological reproduction, and economic reproduction, and the nexus of those three things. Mm-hmm. Right, and mm-hmm. the fact that. Um, very typically, uh, for example, um, you know, in the 1950s in, in the U.S. for 
um, certain classes of, of Americans, you had the breadwinner model, and mm -hmm. that meant that um, male work was uh, remunerated, for example, but female work was not. Was not. And sorts of things like that um, uh, are, are sort of the typical concerns and considerations that happen. I think that, you know, especially as we start seeing feminism in the U.S., uh, move much more sort of towards a post-gender feminism, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of those questions get totally lost because um, if if gender doesn't have anything to do with reproduction, then you can't ever ask these questions about the nexus of economic production and reproduction. Right. There's no. There's no. They, there's no uh, intersection. <laughs> Intersectionality. Yeah. The whole new meaning. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, it almost becomes argued to be transphobic to even ask the question. Yeah. Right. And so she's got this framing of how this argument that reproductive order has somehow been lost. What page, what page are you on? I, I'm on um, 10 of 14. 10. Um, <clears throat> this is the PDF version, right. so you may, you may not have the same. To amplify in periods where there has been a general increase in insecurity. So general that it also affects those who were once the beneficiaries of the prevailing economic order. Um, and basically, she's talking about how we've got this idea that reproductive, the reproductive order is really essential. It's, it's baseline, right? It's a, it's a baseline for how families and society are structured. <laughs> and women are critical to that. And so women are um, scrutinized as to whether or not their work they're doing is this contributing to the reproductive order? Is this helping families or what? And the scrutiny is pointed at women for whether or not they've made a decision that respects the reproductive order. And men never get that kind of scrutiny. Now, mind you, I kind of think they do. I disagree. I think men get that kind of scrutiny, but it doesn't look the same. And I think largely for my part, the problem is not that um, women don't work outside the home, but that men don't work in the home. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's, that's really also so, so that's also yeah, having lived yeah. in indonesia just just a just a point on that um mm -hmm. you know one of one of the things that i noticed in, uh, there which was very different was that the kind of scrutiny that one gets uh, as, as a man there relating to the kinds of work and its support for the family mm -hmm. is a very different kind than i typically have seen in the u.s Right. And um, I think it's a much more wholesome kind because, you know, the question is, are you, prov A, providing for the family, but also um, providing the capital needed perhaps for, for the family to actually, you know, have a business, um, survive on its own profits and right. this sort of thing. And it's a very, very, very different conversation than I've typically seen in the U.S. Right. Right. Whereas here, it's basically: Do you have a job? Get a job. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. A job, job is a fungible thing. They're right. All, <laughs> they're all work, work for the profit. They all hang on else. trees, and you don't just go pick one. Yeah. But you're just too lazy yeah. to go pick a job off the tree and do it. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So that's a so that's an interesting thing. And like I've said. A lot of really important ideas come to the surface here. And yeah. Just these ideas that this is how they're the same. I think the she's got whole chapters on this that we haven't even touched yet. We haven't yet, even plumbed so. yet. <laughs> this idea of moving uh, debt from the state to personal to, to families. Mm -hmm. This idea of moving welfare from the state to families. This idea mm -hmm. of um, um, which I, I'm a little more uh, ambiguous about that you know, reproductive order is actually not a thing that we need to wor be worried about mm -hmm. because, you know, women need to be participating in the economy too. In some very general terms, I'm willing to go there. But um, these are all important ideas. They're big ideas. And she's really opened up a lot about them and how yeah. basically neoliberals and neoconservatives are on the same page. Yeah, on the same page mm -hmm. uh, in a, a worldview where basically the creation of, of children, of families... Mm -hmm is only ever a side hustle <laughs> right, <laughs> right. <laughs> that's like some side thing you're doing that was yeah. well you know that, that was your as, personal choice yeah. you know? as long as it stays out of the way of your productive capacity your economic contributions we, should, we won't yeah. you know censure you for it you yeah know. We, we thought it's okay with us but if you give any tells like you're saying the the woman right. whose kid 
giveaways class. Giveaways you know, class, right? right? If you if you uh, you know if like uh, you know say a uh, uh, nursing pad falls out of your purse in a, it's a meeting with in a meeting <laughs> in a meeting. Well, then you know, you know <laughs> so, there might be some repercussions, right? Right, right. etc. Yeah. If there's if there is any way that you're going to burden the state. Or burden corporations other than right. to give them money. Right. We're going to have to talk. Yep. Well, and this is, I mean, this 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 is one of the things. I mean, you know, we have a lot of conversations in the U.S. about this aggregate wage wage gap, which um, right. you know, mm-hmm. women on average do make less than men, and part of it is due to going uh, having different strategies of careers, uh, preferring different um, different. Uh, different kinds of jobs and things like that. But sure. uh, so the thing that people don't usually get on this is that uh, there's a reason why you have a lot of those um, those differences. And some of it, at least one part of it, is that if you have an economic order that doesn't make room for a reproductive order, that doesn't make room particularly for um, motherhood, um, because you know obviously men have a lot more flexibility in how to integrate parenthood, um, mm-hmm than women do going through pregnancy and childbirth, mm-hmm. um, then, you know, you're going to have this dramatic difference in options available. Right. And that's something that, that, that's, that, that we need a much bigger con- uh, conversation on, around right. in the, and, and, and think people think the it's about, world. they yeah. think it's about, well, two people at the same company doing the same job have to get the same amount of money. That's actually not the right. problem. That's actually not the I mean, yeah. sure, that's it's wrong if it happens, right. but that's not the problem. Yeah. The and problem it, is different. It's That's not even true. <laughs> right, it's not even, right, not even yeah. true. Uh, you know, and there are these, like, there are anecdotes, 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 I'm trying to say this word, um, <laughs> where people have experienced, you know, I yeah. worked at this job right. with this job title and this job responsibility. A man had that job and he got more money for the same work. That has yeah. happened. Sure, it continues it to happen, all the time. but it's not the problem. Yes, no, it's not right. The problem is that there's no space for motherhood, and mm-hmm. for some reason, women keep wanting to be mothers, freaks and weirdos mm-hmm. that they are. Yeah, hippies. <laughs> Just a bunch of hippies, you know. It is- as much as we'd like to outsource that whole job to the, the whole job. developing world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we'll just push that on to Southeast Asia. They'll have all the kids. Exactly. You know, well, now, now and we'll Grace, work. Yes, exactly. Well, we talked a little bit about boarding schools last time, too. And now Grace and I are like, maybe we could just, you know, outsource the actual raising, raising of, of the, the kids. children. Just, let's move that out of the house, you know, because we, yeah. we've got to work. We've got our quotas to think we've got of. got quotas to think of here. None of this bullshit raising a family stuff. What the hell is that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, do you yeah. mind if I move on to some passages from the book that I thought were um, worth citing here? Oh, p- please. And we'll try to uh, we'll try to get through it so we don't make this a three hour <laughs> show. <laughs> a three hour show. Yeah. Because, like you said, we all have have things we need to do. <laughs> we have families to raise. We have families well. to raise. <laughs> Give me podcasting yes, all day. All right. Okay, so page 42, this section, Nixon and the Black Family Wage, exorcising, mm-hmm. not exercising, <laughs> AFDC. In June 1969, the National Welfare Rights Organization officially launched a new campaign in favor of an annual guaranteed income of $5,500. And it, just as an aside, you might think that doesn't sound like much, but actually I was shocked by how high that was yes. in 1969 dollars. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. Mm-hmm. I don't have the conversion at hand, but someone can easily look it up. Um, that sounds like about $18,000 now. At least. That's what it sounds like to me. This right. campaign was designed to phase out AFDC as a stigmatized standalone program and to guarantee a living wage to all welfare recipients. In August 1969, on the advice of Moynihan, that's Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who figures prominently in this chapter, Mm -hmm. President Nixon announced a similar program to replace the state-based AFDC with a more secure federal program known as the Family Assistance Plan. Unlike AFDC, the latter targeted working families and promised to extend basic income guarantees to men, to two-parent families, and those engaged in low-waged work. Nixon, who adopted the plan against the advice of his more conservative colleagues, envisioned the reform as a way of extending the family wage to black men. 
right. while catering to the resentment of mostly white lower income workers who felt excluded from existing public ex- uh, public, public assistance programs. programs. Right. In its broad conception, the family assistance plan was inspired by Moynihan's arguments in favor of the black family wage. By extending welfare to men in two-parent households, the proposed reform was designed to eliminate what many saw as the perverse disincentives to family formation that were built into the AFDC program. Mm -hmm. Its practical blueprint was based on the idea of a negative income tax, first proposed by Milton Friedman in 1962. Friedman conceived of the negative income tax as a way of channeling income redistribution through the federal tax system, thereby eliminating the excessive administrative costs associated with dedicated welfare programs. Those whose income fell below a certain threshold would receive a fraction of their unused tax exemptions and deductions in return, guaranteeing them an annual basic income. By replacing in-kind welfare with the most liquid form of benefit, cash, Friedman thought that the negative income tax would encourage the poor to behave as responsible free market actors. He also specified that's what we all want. (laughs) He also specified that those in low wage work should continue to receive subsidies in order to avoid the moral hazard of promoting non work, which is an interesting point in any um, Any UBI kind of. What about people that just won't work? Yeah. In practice, I doubt that it's actually a, a actually problem. A problem. But, you know, people want their reassurances. Right. With well, its minimal right. but efficient system of redistribution, the negative income tax would bypass the disabling paternalism of the welfare state and undermine the entrenched power base of liberal welfare bureaucrats. Mm-hmm. Uh, so th- I think that's the that's that section. Good old passage. Okay. Thoughts? <clears throat> so... I, I'm always, I'm always shocked by the not shocked, but like perturbed by the assertion. Well, what about the people that won't work? What about them? You mean like children? <laughs> or are you talking about the yeah, disabled? I mean, I mean define what, define you, work. I mean, yeah. First of all, define I, work. I haven't met anybody who doesn't work. Um, right. Right. <laughs> you know, there there are questions of whether that work is remunerated. There are questions uh, on um, how effective something might be right but you know to live is to work i mean and means to be we all do it yeah. right because we all have things that need to get done and we all have duties to other people and we meet them yes i want to say nearly universally we meet them yeah i mean yes. everyone has a story about a family member who was too depressed or non-functioning to to even you know Get out of bed, or, of bed or, or, or you know, who was abusive, who was, who was disturbed in some deep way, some you deep know, way. and and didn't ever find a way to seem productive. Productive, you know? But what this really, I think, is rooted in, yeah, is this idea that what about the people that don't want to make money for corporations? Yes, what about exactly. them? Yeah. What, what, you know, what are we going to do about those people? Right. And no one wants to say that because it would, you know. Give reveal the, the lie. <laughs> right? Yeah. But exactly. that's what people are talking about. That's what they mean. So how are we going to force people to work for corporations yeah. so they can make money yeah. if we give them money? Right. How's that going to work? How am I going to get people to work in my factory if peasants are able to live at home and eat? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there's a, a little later on, um, we talk about uh, the loss of this focus on um, this basic income. I did. I did. Well, there was one Sorry, other go, thing. Go, go, I, I just. I think this is very important. Two things. Two very important things. Number one, I think that the history books will reveal to us in about 150 years uh-huh. that Richard Milhouse Nixon was the most socialist president we've had. <laughs> I, well, like well, when we were talking about this just last night, yeah. in those terms. But yeah. I've said for a very long time, guys, stop swooning over these candidates. They are to the far right of Richard Nixon. Right. So whatever you think of Richard Nixon, that person is far to the right of this guy. This is not something that happened 200 years ago. No. You know, at the found in the early (laughs) days of the United States, this is still within my living memory. Living memory, right? So that's the first thing, and you see over and over again as we sort of unpack history, we have this vilified Nixon 
And how interesting that the, this guy with all these policies is the most vilified in history, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but again, you see the places where this fell apart, where he he now wants to extend benefits to Black Americans, and now wait a second, suddenly all bets are off yep. because I think well, neoliberals and neoconservatives understood both yeah. that that would destabilize the dividing power between the working class. This is, uh, it's so funny to me because Nixon is this reviled guy because we have the tapes in which he reveals all his personal biases against right. Jews and blacks Excellent. and whatnot. He was, and he, was a, a, yeah. he was a really bigoted man, almost right. comically so, almost oh, a caricature. Right. Almost a caricature so of a bigot. Was, yeah. so, was, so was Sherman for crying out loud. But, yeah. you right, know. right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oddly revered for his war crimes, right. but yes. Right. But, yes. But, but, yet, but, but the interesting thing, yeah, go ahead. Oh, just in practice, like Grace was saying, he was the, practically the most socialist president we've yeah. had in recent times. Actually in practice. And he did promote these. Yeah. And But for Ted Kennedy, yeah. he would have had universal health care for a very long time now. Sure. Instead, we got HMOs. Yeah. So, just for the record. Yeah. So, uh, and, and what were you about to say? The other side yeah. of Nixon is that, you know, I mean, it was Nixon that, that started setting aside uh, federal set-asides for uh, contracts for minority-owned businesses also. Right. And um, whatever, uh, you know, um, complaints one might have relating to the effectiveness of other affirmative action programs, mm-hmm. you know, there's something really important in that idea. Oh, right, um, right. You know, because this is this is this is something which now starts democratizing capital, not just integrating the shop floor, but right. but, but trying to uh, trying to integrate the uh, owning class as well. Right, right. And I want you to notice that forty years later, to some degree, that's worked. Mm-hmm. Yes, there's more. So it's the owning class is much more integrated now than it was. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and so this idea. And it's it's like the, if I could get behind affirmative action, maybe this is the way I could do it. Where you say, okay, these individuals represent thirteen percent of society. Maybe they should represent thirteen percent of our contracts. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, mm-hmm. maybe we're doing something mm-hmm. wrong. That seems like a rational approach. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then what you do see later on is you see folks in the owning class that would not have gotten there otherwise, and it was yeah. state intervention that allowed that to happen. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Okay. So I'm going to skip the next quote I had because it actually consists of Friedman saying that in his view, Nixon was the most socialist president of the 20th century. (laughs) But um, let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, By the late 1960s, even the most progressive of old Democrats and champions of the Great Society, Mm -hmm. a position exemplified by a figure such as Moynihan, were alarmed at the direction in which leftist welfare politics was heading. Right. These future neoconservatives had supported the extension of the family wage to black men, but recoiled from redistributive welfare reform as such when they found themselves outflanked by a new and countercultural left. In particular, they were alarmed by those elements at the margins of the new left that questioned the very premise of the family wage, the notion, that is, that income redistribution should be linked to the normative policing of legitimate childbearing and sexual morality. As we have seen, this critique was extremely marginal even among the most countercultural tendencies within the new left, and indeed within the welfare rights movement itself. Yet it was in reaction to this countercultural and anti normative left, a left that challenged the sexual foundations of the Fordist consensus, that neoconservatism was born. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So basically when the fringes of sexual politics started asserting their ideas and saying, hey, state welfare should apply to these groups too. Does she give examples of that? Like a functional example, because I'm actually, I'm actually not that good with that history. I'm I can not, tell you I'm, all about welfare rights and all that stuff. Yeah. And I can tell you about AFTC and New Deal politics and that. Right. But um, she's, I, I think she's talking precisely about the sexual revolution, yeah. About uh, the gay rights movement, and about um, well, at this at this point, the gay rights movement was still really it's or, very or, nascent. Or, yeah, but no, nascent, it's very yeah. nascent. I think Stonewall was like five or six years old at this right. point when mm-hmm. this sort of like 
So that it's it's there. But it's also it's very nice. And the women's rights movement has when, is basically in its second wave at this point. And that's emergent. She doesn't really give examples, but she uh she um she quotes people. So okay. she quotes Crystal. And this is Crystal the Elder. The elder. Not the younger. Not the younger, right. Uh, and not Cri- the comedian. Crystal right. Crystal <laughs> noted that sexual liberation is always very near the top of a countercultural agenda. Women's liberation, likewise, is another consistent feature of all countercultural movements. Liberation from husbands, liberation from children, liberation from family. Indeed, the only real object of these various sexual heterodoxies is to disestablish the family as the central institution of human society, the citadel of orthodoxy. Right. This so sounds, this is, this is women's rights, abortion rights, and gay rights. Yeah, who's that, that preacher that said women want to, you know, the feminism wants to train women to... <laughs> Burn their bras, practice witchcraft, <laughs> murder their children, and become lesbians. Is that Pat? Pat? Uh, oh gosh, Robertson. I, uh, who, who? Do you know who that was? It's it's like a famous yeah, quote. It's a, anyway, it's it's one of these evangelical yeah. preachers. Yeah, right. That's true. I'm also not really, really good with my evangelical preachers. So, <laughs> for some reason. For some reason. So so that's those movements were nascent and were not mainstream in the seventies. Yes. Or the 80s. She goes on in this section to talk a little bit about um, sort of uh, wildcat strikes and trade unions unions getting a little <coughs> more aggressive. Right, you know? right. And, because part of the New Deal agreement was to basically muzzle unions into a back seat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, where they could barely function and barely... The one thing they could do is maintain wages with respect to inflation. That was like the only thing that they could do. About the only thing they were allowed to negotiate. A lot to negotiate to do. I mean, even healthcare was kind of like dicey. And, and even there, I mean, you know, the the side was, you know, that alone was supposed to be the big um, counterweight to all of the uh, sort of business consolidation aspects of the new, of the new deal. Right. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I mean, growing up in rural areas, I never really understood that about the new deal because all I associated it with was uh, work programs that built, say, schools and post offices and hydro dams and brought electricity and these other things. Right. But which is not untrue. (laughs) Right. But, but in the cities, it was a totally different experience. And, Mm -hmm. you know, the more I learn about it, the the less I am a fan of it. (laughs) Right, yeah. right. And and for most Americans in 2018, how could you not be a fan of the New Deal? What's yeah. wrong with you? Mm. Like, well, let's start to unpack some of this. I mean, for those of you who consider yourselves anti-racist, first of all, understand that the New Deal was predicated mm-hmm. entirely mm-hmm. on the fact that black mm-hmm. people would not receive these benefits, full right. stop. Right. Mm-hmm. Maybe you know somebody, an uncle or a cousin or somebody, who kind of sort of did get some benefit as a person of color in the United States. But largely, the reason it existed and could happen in the United States Mm -hmm. was the agreement that black people would not receive any of these benefits. This is is what she means by like what the the definition of the family wage was and how it changed. Right. right? Right. So it had been for white working class men and their families. Yeah. And in the 60s, there was this idea, okay, maybe... Maybe we could open up to black men. Whoa! Right. I don't know about that, said America. But, but yeah, but Nixon, that great but Nixon socialist, was, was all about actually it. He's like, oh, that. Let's, let's do it. Okay. All right. Let's do it. And and he was a horrible bigot yeah. at the same time. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this um this this larger thing with the New Deal, where um we're going to have the New Deal, but what it means that unions in the United States are effectively castrated and non functional. Uh huh. That was the bargain. Yeah. And I don't know, that's not mm-hmm. much of a bargain, really. So what you no. saw later on is as workers are becoming more constrained and more precious on them, you start seeing these really marginalized yeah. people yeah. who are the only people who have nothing to lose at this point, <clears throat> having wildcat strikes and really kind of, fl- out, like you said, outflanking mm-hmm. the sort of more mainstream... The left. Supp- right. Supposed the left. Outflanking the supposed left to say, listen... No, we're we're going we're going on strike. Yeah. We're actually going to do these things that the unions need to do, and actually have the right to do, without state re- repercussions, in other countries throughout the world. So that's that's really what they were looking at and responding to yeah. was like, hey, and these folks want to do really freaky stuff. Right. So she she goes on that the um, the uh, con- neoconservative critique of the counterculture transmuted somehow directly into a critique 
of AFDC. And I'm going to read it a paragraph here. Uh, AFTC recipients could hardly be characterized as the most privileged of social subjects. Right. And this is, this is fascinating, and I think it's really true. Um, and yet the neoconservatives consistently describe welfare mothers as a non-productive rentier class. <laughs> <laughs> a lumpen proletariat that has taken on the qualities of the idle aristocracy. Mm. By virtue of its, this is one of my favorite passages in this chapter, honestly. Right. Um, by virtue of its dependence on the, quote, unearned income, unquote, of welfare benefits, neoconservative rhetoric caters to the resentment of Fordism's most protected workers by reversing the order of actual social hierarchy amongst the poor, presenting itself as the defender of the white, blue collar working class against the demands of an unproductive, rentier class of welfare and she italicizes the word queens, queens. <laughs> <laughs> a move that is characteristic of a reactionary populism on both the left and right yes. if inflation had come to be associated in the popular imagination with the problem of sumptuary speculation since everyday consumers had learned that it was in their interest to buy on credit the moral denunciations that accompanied this observation felt disproportionately on the shoulders of the non-working poor. The non-working poor, right. And mind you, as late as the the late 1980s, early 90s, um, the notion that not having a job, in order, not working for corporations in order to care for your family, in order family, to care for your family, yeah, was a responsible mm -hmm. thing to do. It, it was them, responsible for white parents. Right, it was for a white mother yeah. to stay home and care for her children and take welfare money to do so. And if the white woman was staying home to do this and the husband wasn't there, that didn't reflect on her It didn't character. reflect on her. It reflected on his character, but right. not on hers. Right. Mm -hmm. Because she was at home taking care of her children, mm -hmm. and yep. it was the responsibility of the state to, ma to make that possible. Whereas a black woman in, in the, a similar situation, situation, it was all about her character. It was all about her character and how, and how she's some kind of welfare the queen. The crisis of the American family. And this yeah, crisis but... of, of uh, responsibility and moral, de moral degeneracy. Yep. And mm -hmm. um, it took decades to erode that perspective yep. so that anyone who's taken welfare money is just a moral degenerate. And honestly, Reagan, this great icon of the conservatives, conservatism, coasted in on that, you know, on that rhetoric. On that rhetoric. So. Yeah. Well, bless his heart. As you were saying. Okay. <laughs> I got, I'm trying to get through this here. Um, let's see. I'm going to skip that because I can't make sense of what I meant to say about it at the moment. <laughs> uh, in the chapter, neoconservatism and neoliberalism, we introduced some of this earlier about their like death grip and how they feed into each other. Mm -hmm. Crystal, uh, this is Irving Crystal, Irving Crystal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. account of neoliberalism's amoralism is one that might be readily endorsed by commentators on the left, but it fails to do justice to the nuance of the neoliberal position which does not so much eliminate moral philosophy as posit an imminent, I-M-M-A-N-E-N-T, mm -hmm. ethics of virtue and a spontaneous order of family values that it expects to arise automatically from the mechanics of the free market system. That's demented. And this is, this is part of the, the analysis, is that right. if you just kick out the... Um, this is me talking, not her. Not her. But <laughs> if you just kick the chocks out from under the wheels, if you just kick, you know, take the kickstand off and whatnot, and you know, push the cyclist down, down the hill. Down the hill. They'll be riding by the, the bottom. They'll be <laughs> right. The 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 the, uh, the, mech, the invisible hand of the market will automatically produce the most virtuous and moral outcomes, and the person riding the bike will. Like you say, learn to ride by the time they crash. Right, it'll yeah. be great. <laughs> well, and and just but, but morally, yeah. not just like they'll figure out the mechanics of it, but that if they figure out the mechanics of it, they will automatically have elevated themselves to a, a morally superior standard, place, right? And you Which, still hear that rhetoric. You still hear it. It's yeah. insane. It's, it's absolutely insane. insane. Because what has actually happened is that. 
we've created a dialectic where morality is only ever about sex. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if we want to discuss morality, we're perverts and prudes. Right. And well, we can't discuss morality at all. And that's the dialect. And, and family and family values also become only about sex. Or only about sex. That's all that we're talking One about. One can never really talk about sort of the economics of the family and how to try to support families. Uh, support families. And yeah. how to try to have a an economy where, where families do well together. Yeah. Um, right. So yeah. what, what you have on one hand is this shifting of responsibility to the family. And on the other hand, sort of taking away... Um, Making sure we can't talk about what families need to do to thrive on, like how how to do a family, right? Yes, right. So yeah. your family has to take care of it, but we can't discuss how. You right. just figure that out right. through the magic of the free market. Maybe we can teach you Excel. I know. <laughs> so, You'll get a job where where you help your company uh, produce more in sales, and they create and demand, and somehow this will help. This will help. <laughs> <laughs> and then step four, we profit. Yeah. Yay. So it's really just this deep well, absurdity. That, that thing, Chris is laughing. But that is true. I mean, it's how you keep a job, it's right? A job. But but yeah. it has very little to do with my personal morality. Morality. Honestly. And in right? fact, a, a really strong sense of personal morality and ethics is obviously a hindrance, a hindrance. in trying to navigate the <laughs> yeah. job The job situation. market or the economy in any way. Yeah. And the, the sort of... Because of this dialectic where it's only about sex and families, it's only about sex and morality. And since, on the other hand, so when we can't talk about that because it's a private personal decision, mm -hmm. now we can't talk about morality in our politics and our economy yeah. and say that our wars right. are immoral, yep. full stop. Our economy yes. is immoral, full yep. stop. Our immigration policy, this is mm -hmm. moral. And what, what We've lost the more capacity yeah. to be moral. And my own personal... I don't know, that rage quit, <laughs> desire to rage quit mm -hmm. comes when I hear uh, religious authorities mm -hmm. or scholars or even um, pundits adopting this language of morality that came from the market, that came from this, this market morality. Right. And, and speaking in religious terms about, about, about it. And yeah. it is everywhere. And it's like, it's like this prosperity gospel contamination uh, of, of the gospels. Everything. It's, it's like, like it's in like this the tar that, you can't wash, wash it off. Yeah, it's in, in that um, the Inside Out Pixar movie. Mm -hmm. The one character, the blue sadness character. Right. Every 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 memory that she touches is tinged with sadness. sadness right. <laughs> right. It's like so every just about every subject we take up now. Is tinged with this neoliberal taint, this you know? Taint. Yeah, <laughs> like, absolutely. Oh, uh, so moral critique, moral that, critique that's all really capitalist critique, you right? Know, in disguise, and it's and it's capitalist critique masquerading as morality, masquerading as yeah, as you know, religion, as religion, as, as, all as the gospel, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's it's it's, it's horrific. Yeah, it's and, just profane. All right, Gary S. Becker. She cites Gary S. Becker, who wrote a book called A Treatise on the Family. It's a lot of footnotes. That's the only way I know what she's talking about. about. The dramatic changes in the structure of the family have more to do with the expansion of the welfare state in the post-war era than with feminism per se, which can be considered a consequence rather than an instigator of these dynamics. Predictably, Becker singles out AFDC, the, quote, poor woman's alimony, unquote. I thought that was a great oh, phrase. Oh. There you go, yeah. As one of the prime culprits in the breakdown of the family. Sure. Like Friedman, he also credits more generic social insurance programs and public services such as state the education. education. <gasps> Those government schools will get you every time. Every time, though. Public service uh, with weakening the bonds of familiar, familial obligation. Mm -hmm. For Becker, the family in its equilibrium state, this is great, this is so great, <laughs> can be understood as serving a kind of natural insurance function that is disturbed when the welfare state socializes insurance. Mm. The fact that fathers, quote, choose, unquote, to support wife and children, and mothers, quote, choose, unquote, to perform most of the unpaid reproductive work of care, thus relieving the state of any such responsibilities, mm. represents the equilibrium state of the family in a free market order. Mm. 
a state of mutual dependence and self-sufficiency that neoliberal welfare reform must strive to restore. If we can therefore derive a pragmatic policy lesson from neoliberalism's philosophy of the family, it's that the dismantling of welfare represents the most effective means of restoring the private bonds of familial obligation. Mm. Writing in the early 1980s, Becker credits the post-war welfare state with destroying the natural altruism of the family, but surmises that the decline in welfare initiated by Reagan mm -hmm. will ultimately compel the poor to restore the bonds of kinship as a source of privatized welfare. You, you hear this, you hear the sort of like moralizing in yeah. that, right? Yeah. They've just abandoned their own families <laughs> for a check. Yeah. Look at those pores. I just <laughs> I hope she dug, digs into this more, but it's this same kind of thing where I'm always hearing people flipping cause and effect. Right, right. Now that was happening because you know, because you know, like industry eradicate families. Because you notice the the neoliberal concept of family, it can look like anything, right? It can be any kind of thing. Yeah. It's cool and it's fine as long as you take care of yourself, except. A multi-generational parents, grandparents, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, oh, yeah. extended family support. Mm -hmm. That's not something the state's going to support because those people, those people don't need your jobs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and there's so much that goes away with that, too. Right. I mean, right. all of the... Uh, uh, all of all of the expenses or all the expenditures that would go with independent retirement, if those go away, I mean... Right. So suddenly, you pull all that money out of the economy, and now it's replaced by an intergenerational family, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I would mm -hmm. argue and would submit... Now, mind you, I know there are always people who are like, but you know how dysfunctional families can be. Yes, we all know. <laughs> We've all got one. <laughs> We've all got one, and we all know how deeply dysfunctional families could be. Yeah, that's actually not what we're talking about here. What I am talking about is the way that families got by in spite of their dysfunction by having multiple members serving multiple functions and were actually a lot more resilient, resilient yeah. than yeah. any nuclear family from the 1950s forward in the United States. Sure. Like yeah. even the most wealthy nuclear right. families because like if you notice even the really wealthy families they've got their cousins and their uncles and their aunts and everybody involved yeah right yeah. they're all at the table yeah with the nuclear family there's no labor in reserve even emotional labor in even reserve. emotional labor right. Right. which actually is kind of the most critical labor yeah to getting through the you know yes the hard stuff yeah. that's where all your resilience is so that's the lie in where they're talking about when they're like this is some, some, some kind of pro-family policy right it's not that neoliberals completely reject the idea of virtue then, mm -hmm. as Crystal wants to argue, but rather that they expect the strictest of virtue ethics to arise spontaneously from the imminent, again, the, the what does that word even mean? It's like naturally ar arising, fountaining, forth like, um, of... Emanating uh, from... But not eminent, imminent. Uh, imminent like with an E? About, no, I. With an I? Yeah, it's, it's a not different... Impending? No, well, it means like about to arrive. About to arrive. Yeah, but it, it's it's through some kind of. You see this word in, used in in talking about religious experience and and mystical action and things like that, of like things that arrive um, fortuitously at the right when they're needed. Emanatize the esca eschaton. Emanatize the Emanatize, eschaton. Right. right yeah. Like that word. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Sorry, I'm off on a. Off on a, a language it's, it's an English. Sorry. It's an occupational hazard of English majors. Economic systems that rely, this is quote, on private behavior and competitive markets are more efficient than those with extensive government control. Writes Becker. Hmm. However, the effects of a free market system on self-reliance, initiative, and other virtues may be of even greater importance in the long run. Mm -hmm. This, he explains, is why 19th-century defenders of the free market quote, often emphasize the system's effects on values rather than on, than on efficiency. Right. Predictably going on to, quote, Tocqueville on the mutually reinforcing relationship between self-interest and virtue. Mm -hmm. Thus, if neoliberals can in one respect be described as laissez-faire on the question of family, 
in the sense that they believe that cutbacks in government social spending will automatically restore the natural virtues of kinship obligations. That means right. ha- hands off, right? Right. So hands off the family, they'll, 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 it'll be better for them. It'll be better for right. them if we just get out of the way. This does not make them any less concerned with ne- the necessity of family in a free market order. It simply means that they theorize fundamental value itself as the emergent effect of market forces rather than its a priori foundation. Right, which is, you know, like a classic fundamental cart before the horse. Yeah. Like, so no, 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 no. The market produces morality. Right. Morality doesn't produce the market. Right. Come on, guys. For the neoconservative, by contrast, the ideal family... This is fascinating to me. I'm sorry if it's getting a little dull, but But the ideal family is not the natural result of market forces, but an institution that in some sense opposes the market and lies outside it. Its fundamental values must be actively produced by the state if it is to survive the corrosive force of contractual exchange. This sounds backwards, right? right. These are, these are neoconservatives. Mm-hmm. In this respect, neoconservatives appear much closer to left social democrats, mm-hmm. such as Karl Polanyi, mm-hmm. than they do to neoliberals. Right. Most of them, after all, continued to support the basic functions of the welfare state in an era when neoliberal arguments in favor of small government were otherwise on the ascendant. Remember, remember capacity conservatives? Yeah. yeah, even Irving Kristol, among neoconservatives the most sympathetic to the free market ideas of Ronald Reagan, insisted that neoconservatism, quote, feels no lingering hostility to the welfare state, nor does it accept it resignedly as a necessary evil. Instead, it seeks not to demand, dismantle the welfare state in the name of free market economics, but rather to reshape it so as to attach it to the conservative predispositions of the people. Right. So. So, yeah. That's. <laughs> I'm going to unpack that. <laughs> There's a lot in this yeah. book that, right, right. that we have to unpack. So, the neoconservative idea was rather that, because, um, okay, on neoliberals, the market produces morality. Right. Okay, total total lunacy. I think. But on the neoconservative side was that the state has a function of producing morality and i think they wanted to shape the nature of the 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 welfare programs to to it was more paternalistic in that sense to guide oh, people the, towards the state and its welfare programs would 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 be an arm to enforce morality yeah and or promote it and promote you saw us, this right. with like thousand points of light kind of thing yep, where yep. you're actually you know we could actually or they actually like dropped all pretense and right. just said we could just give money to organizations that we like that we think are doing good work are doing good work and doing good moral work yeah. right and that mm-hmm. so basically we're using the state as a carrot yeah the money of the state is a carrot to in encourage yeah a sort of a predetermined morality or or um a standard traditional morality yeah as the standard bearer. Yeah, again, uh, this is hard to, to, to get through. It's a little, like, it's dense. It's a little... See, I'm going to need a, more examples of that. Yeah, now. and a lot of her analysis sort of tends to flip the script on, like, the standard analysis. But there's one right. more There's one more passage I want to okay, read, yeah. and this is the last passage I want to read from, from the book. From the book, yeah. Let's hear it. Um, when even the harshest incentives fail to work... Neoliberals have in practice relied on the much more overt forms of behavioral correction favored by social conservatives. Although they rarely acknowledge or theorize this imperative, neoliberals must ultimately delegate power to social conservatives in order to realize their vision of a naturally equilibrating free market order and a spontaneously self-sufficient family. Neoliberalism and social conservatism are thus tethered together (laughs) by a working relationship that is both necessary and disavowed. Right? It's like uh, it's like Mission Impossible. You know, if you are if you are caught, the agency will will uh, disavow any knowledge of of your activities. (laughs) The conservatives are doing what? We had no idea. As an ideology of power that only ever acknowledges its reliance on market mechanisms and their homologues, 
neoliberalism can only realize its objectives by proxy, that is, by outsourcing the imposition of non-contractual obligations to social conservatives. In extremis, neoliberals must turn to the overt neoconservatism, neoconservatives, neoconservative methodology of state-imposed transcendent virtue to realize their dream of an imminent virtue ethics of the market. And I think oh, basically yes. this is a little hard to unpack, but my oh, take oh, I get it. Go ahead, go ahead. my take is because they have seeded like any kind of a standard definition of a, a moral family. Right. That, but they still rely. They're they're relying on other people to do the scolding and the, right. the and to basically keep setting the, the the standard and promoting like the gold standard of it's family. It's actually even it's even like more weirder weirder than that, yeah. right? Or deeper than that. Yeah. And you know, t- chime in, Chris, if you've got a different take. Um, um. Yeah. Go ahead. If they're working on a fundamental lie. Yes. They have a foundational lie. And since it's a foundational lie, they can at no point admit that there needs to be some kind of morality right. to guide the market. Yes. So they have to literally just look the other way. They see that whole area the whole of the thing, argument and ignore it. Ignore it and pretend that's not part of anything going on. Yeah. And in fact, scold the scolds for even talking about it. The whole category of ethics, family right. ethics. Just, we're not, you know, that's not something for us to talk about they, or pass judgment on. Leave it all to individual liberties. Right. Individual liberties, etc. And But nothing, no plan they have can function without some kind of morality to guide it, some kind of governing morality, mm-hmm. something. Yeah. In, in fact, you know, when I, when I was at college, I had this uh, um, professor who was an African-American um, woman who was uh, an avowed communist. And one of the very interesting things she hated about the Democrats was exactly what you're describing, about the fact that she said, you know, the only people who are allowed to talk about um, the impacts uh, on all of this on the family are, you know, the, the Christian right. right. And so... So they're, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're setting the boundaries of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. And we actually can't just leave that to the Christian right. No. Right? Yeah. And as a conservative Christian... Right. We yeah, need a yeah. Christian left. We need a Christian left. We need yeah. Christian uh, radicals. Yes. They all need to be part of the conversation for us to come up with anything anything that even makes sense. Right. Otherwise, and, we end up my, with these deep perversions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and in fact, in my view, I, th- I, think, I think there needs to be um, uh, many more, since we're a pluralistic society anyway in the U.S., there need to be many more... Uh, religious religious sure. right wings sure. and religious left wings, wings. and yeah. all right. of the rest of this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I would. I mean, you know, it, it annoys a whole lot of people for me to say this, but mm-hmm. you know, if if in my lifetime we see a Muslim on the Supreme Court in the U.S., I think that would um, We'd be, be going a long a really, way. Really oh, good yeah. Thing. yeah, right. I mean, at the very least, policy that is t- completely tolerant of of these other. Traditions, I, I but I don't. Just, I don't yeah. even want. To, I don't want to stop at tolerance. I want to say supportive, right? right. But exactly. tolerant in the sense of you know, like we've talked about hijabis. You know, we've right. talked about that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But but yeah, I mean, what? So what vision of their family order do mm-hmm. they yeah. do they need support? Do they need help supporting? Right or, or what? Yeah. Right. And frankly, I think if we actually had a conversation that was actually informed by lived morality of yeah. actual people, yeah. the conversation would look very different yeah. than the morality being um, sort of foisted upon prescriptive. us, prescriptive <laughs> yeah. morality, mm-hmm. from the religious right. Yeah. And, the and, and on the other side to this is that the thing that, that one never gets from the religious right in the U.S. is the question of why is family important? Why does it matter? Yes. Yeah, exactly. So you you just have, it matters, it matters, it matters, but there's no why. why. (laughs) Obviously, we need our labor supply. (laughs) Right? Yeah, but but the thing about it is that... (laughs) That's the reason they can't answer that question. Yeah. What what it means is what? But but it means that we never, ever get a chance to talk about the state as sort of the cultivator of 
um, sustainable communities because mm -hmm. you know sustainable communities is only some sort of fringe movement. Sure, you know sure. <laughs> who needs sustainability anyway, right? right? What's that about? Well, weirdos. Yeah. And as a result, we sure don't have it. Don't have it because <laughs> so. that's the market will provide that if it's needed. Oh god. Yeah. You're gonna need to lie down. So the market's not providing it. It must not be necessary, right? So yeah, yeah. Right. So what we're left with is uh, neoliberals quietly looking the other way mm -hmm. because if they address it they then have to acknowledge that they're fundamentally wrong mm -hmm. that everything mm -hmm. they've said everything they've advanced is wrong at its core and that yeah that it's old ideas in, right in old new ideas and new, and, and new wines again and it's gonna yeah. it's gonna burst right, right. versus mm -hmm. um and then just now that that whole territory of morality is ceded to new conservatives who basically have nothing to push against them to even shape, because that's really what we see in Nixon. Yeah. Here's what you see in Nixon. Yeah. He was a conservative Quaker. whack job, a, a Quaker, a right. committed Quaker, right. who had outside forces to push on him. Mm -hmm. Bigger than mm -hmm. as he was, he came up with something that looks a lot better than what I've seen anybody bring to the table he actually pushed in the last 30 years. on some of those right. trends, including his own bigotry. <laughs> including his own bigotry. And yeah. it's those trends pushing on him that caused those policies to emerge mm -hmm. it's that dialectic and we've moved to his place where there's no dialectic about it yes right it's just it's you know it's like andy warhol's warhol's uh biography the entire range of of uh, thought from a to b a to b <laughs> ding yeah all right, all right. i think um i'm gonna invite everyone for to uh you have closing statements or, <laughs> or closing <laughs> remarks, um, and then we should wind up because it's getting hot down here. It's starting to get hot down here. Yeah. Um, it's probably a hundred degrees in our family room upstairs. Oh, poor family. Kids are probably asleep, passed out, <laughs> passed out, thirsty. Probably like to give them a watermelon. But the, um, <laughs> closing thoughts. Um, Chris, any, any closing thoughts? Yeah, actually, uh, one of the things that that that. Uh, sort of I, I sort of wonder is um where we take this from here and obviously this isn't a discussion for this podcast but mm -hmm. more for the listeners is uh you know we have all of these discussions about family family structure family matters and all the rest of this and how do we take it in a direction of a humane society which not the humane society but a humane society <laughs> right which um which which treats people reasonably and factions regardless of where they come from and and um you know how they fit in and at the same time you know uh creates a um sustainable future for all of us yeah. right if we're going to be in a humane society i just want to be in a no kill shelter <laughs> i'm going to specify that right now, right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i'm going to volunteer so, for the no kill shelter too yeah. Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right, uh, so I um you know I want to continue reading this book. I'm really intrigued. Yeah. And maybe we need some time cuz I didn't fall asleep at the park You're when you were reading. You're going to need a, a, a lot of coffee. <laughs> a lot of coffee, some late nights. I, uh, I find it it's really worth it to push through because then really you run into it. these pieces that are like, oh, oh, it's really startling. Holy smokes. But but um, yeah, it's it's but it's hard. I maintain my dissatisfaction with really the, understanding the thesis. like what's yeah. You know, I'm I'm really frustrated. You need to tell me your thesis. Well, you fell asleep during the introduction too. Oh, well, so, yeah. did she mention a thesis during the introduction? The whole. Well, that's the thing. It's not a thesis you can state in three sentences. It took her the whole first chapter of gibberish to state it. To and, state her thesis, and yeah. that's. It's uh, hard. That's, it's hard. I'll just put it this way: that's a problematic. We're gonna. <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna have her calling in angrily. Like, calling angrily. Well, who are you people? What do you even know? Eh, yeah. Nothing really. Um, yeah, so nothing. that's that's where I'm at. I want to push forward with this book, and I want I want to read more. This yeah. is this is I think is really we're gonna continue stuff. with this book. Yeah, this is great stuff. It's fascinating. And I, I and really want to get I'm to learning. Shuja Hyder's book too, the identity right. politics. The identity book. politics. That's book. much shorter, by the way. Thank goodness. I think it's less jargony. I started reading. It's yeah, less yeah. jargony, but um, so. There's a payout in plowing through this book. It's worth it. I'm learning a lot. I'm enjoying what I'm learning. But I'm just, I'm uncomfortable not knowing 
what her thesis is. Yeah. And yeah. feeling like it's just not very clear what her thesis is. I think uh, her thesis was her thesis. Right. In other words, that this, this was her her thesis. In other words, oh, the thesis oh, was, this is how I get my PhD. <laughs> I, I don't know that. <laughs> amen, <laughs> amen. Do what you have I, to I mean, do. I don't know that for yeah, sure, but, but it, it sort of feels like it. Feels a like a, I feel like a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to push on and keep uh, plowing through yeah. and um, hopefully learn more. And if I feel, if I find a thesis, I will, I will tell her. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. <laughs> You'll be the, you'll be the <laughs> second to know. You'll be the second to know. <laughs> All right. I don't have any great words of wisdom to sum it up, but like Grace, I'm interested in this book. It is, it is a slog, and there are so many other things I'm trying to read. It's frustrating. I honestly, I, I have this ongoing impulse to just like, we're just. I'm gonna quit my job, and you and I are gonna do a daily show. We're right? gonna, it's do gonna a daily be four show. hours a day. <laughs> we'll live stream it. It'll be on. But you know that's that's clearly that's not we're not quite ready for that. Not ready for that. No. But we do. I uh, really just want to uh, again say, we do know we know that we have some listeners. Yes. And we've gotten positive feedback from some of our listeners, and um, I would just like to ask the listeners to help us shape how we do this. You yeah. know, chip in. What did you find interesting about this topic? What would you like us to pursue, um, in our sort of intellectual journey? Hmm. <laughs> Uh, uh, of pretensions <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah. and ambitions beyond our our class and <laughs> our education level. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and so I'd love we'd love to hear from our love to hear from our listeners, from listeners and and tell your friends. Yeah, get them into the conversation. We'd love to talk to you. Yeah, because we have uh, we have more stuff coming up. We've got we're starting to line up more guests yeah. as well. And uh, again, we're. Chris, we're very, very happy you could join us again. Thought it was a good, interesting talk. Yeah, and we'll probably hit Thanks. you up next month, too. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, sure. So, oh, no complaints. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, I'm going to read a little outro here. Uh, you've been listening to the Grace and Paul Podcast. Check out the show blog at podcast.blogspot.com, where you can leave comments or search for the Grace and Paul Podcast on Facebook or YouTube. Bye. Later. Later.